We can just start by um, introducing our speaker. Okay, cool. There you are. <laughs> so um, yeah, we'll get started. Um, so so today we're super lucky to have um, Nasila Mavoir, who is a Jamaican American contemporary abstract artist based in Brooklyn, speaking with us today. Um, so he uses a synesthetic approach um, to fuse his dreams with social commentary, ancient mythologies, music, astrophysics principles, um, and all of that to create these like sprawling cosmic scenes that you'll see in his art. So uh, some places that he, he's been featured has been Lace Magazine, African Student Organization's Arts in Africa Showcase, American University Museum, Center for Peace Buildings International Peace Campaign in Bosnia, as well as uh, local cafes and um, private art collections in DC and New York. Um, so we are really grateful to have him here showing us kind of how we can, uh, you know, be inspired by our work and all of our senses to create some abstract piece as well. So thank you, Nisilo. You can take it from here. Um, all right, cool. Well, thank you. I appreciate you guys for having me here. Um, I'm just going to start off a little bit by telling you about what got me into art and why I specifically chose this style. Um, so most of my career, I've been in like humanities, um, political science, and natural relations work. And um, around the 2016 period where like, political tension in the United States was ramping up, I felt like I needed a different way to communicate after being in policy focused positions for so long. And this was um, all this work is based off of like things that I physically see, like experience, right? So how it really stems from my work in trying to, you know, help others, right? How can I also help them see it another way and see it another experience? So I use um, sound and music to influence the, the colors I will use in a piece and I mix them with. Um, you know, things that I might experience in my own personal life, things that I've read about, um, and social commentary that I see that may be poignant to things that we're going, to, going on, like that are we are experiencing in real life. Um, so after starting in 2016, uh, it was just for a gen, ed, a gen ed art class I had to take in college. Um, and my teacher kept telling me that I wasn't good enough to do certain things. So I, I literally spent the whole class like doing exactly what he told me not to do. Um, I didn't get a good grade in that class, but it sparked um, like my love for art and translating like images that are very accessible to anybody to see. And by the end of that year, I was able to um, get an exhibition in my school's museum. And from there, I've just been painting and creating more and more and more. So. Um, that's where I kind of began, and I'm going to show you some of my pieces, explain um, the thinking and the meanings behind it, and some of the techniques that I show, that I use to get there. So if you have any questions along the way, feel free to stop me and ask me, because I will forget. <laughs> so give me one second to share my Oh, you're muted. My bad. All right, so this is one of my newest paintings. Um, I spent the last year or so making this one. Um, and um, some of the scientific principles that I that I use to influence this painting are topography maps that indicate like elevation and overall like geography and a location and what that may look like. Um, and, and as well as translating some, like my, my art is really about subject, subverting expectations, right? So when you look at this piece, you're looking at it from a top down view. So you're looking at a land mass flying over, right? But you would expect the, the surface of this structure to be rough and rugged, but I wanted to subject the, the expectation of that. So I chose to make it kind of like an airy gas giant type of uh like stuff 
Like when you look at a planet like Jupiter or like Jupiter, for example, it's just a swirling mass of of gases. So even if you tried the million, like say you had an aircraft that was strong enough to to deal with the gravity the gravity on on that planet, you would never reach the surface because there is there isn't one. And a way that I utilize scientific principles in my work is by using them to inform um, some like anecdotal lessons that we can learn as well. Right. So this art piece is about breaking through like turmoil and obstacles in order to find a new like energy and reignite a passion in yourself that otherwise wasn't there. I mean that that used to be there, right? And in that can be um an intangibility. Like um when in in there's a French saying of Azuna say quoi, like you don't know what it is, right? So there's an intangibility of talent sometimes of prospect or uh, just a feeling. And this was my way to kind of um, visualize that, right? But additionally, when it comes to like your talent and whatever path you may take, there are highs and lows, right? So I have mountain structures that are in the piece with the rings around that that you would find on a topography map to indicate, okay, this may be a peak, this may be a depression. Um, and when you, if you, I'm gonna zoom in, you can see that there are there are outlines on the page. Like we have um, on like atlases and things like that that demark different nations and what and the the land barriers or imaginary barriers that we elicit. So think of this piece as a like a planet, right? The planet signifies your core, and at the center of it is all the things that um, bring about like your drive. Right, and sometimes it takes breaking through something that you otherwise thought was like constantly persistent to kind of find out what is it um, that it really meant to you in the first place. So this is my way of trying to exemplify that. Um, on a painting like this, and you're trying to get these specific type of strokes, it takes dozens and dozens of layers sometimes. A painting like this, at least for me, has at least like 30 different layers of paint. And they can be thick, um, thick layers, like heavy amount of paint, or sometimes it could be um, a very light layer. Um, the difference between a thick layer and a light layer is just how much water that you use um, to mix it. I use acrylic painting, which acrylic is basically plastic paint, right? It's very quick drying, which is why so many like new artists use it because it's kind of easy to use. But the thing about acrylic is that because it dries so fast, you don't have a lot of time to direct it in the way that you would like to right so a way that i can get the way that i get around that is that i use tons of layers to construct um the specific image that i want to go through so i may say i may paint a, a light green but my ending color may be a purple but that green will serve um as a way to darken some aspects of the painting and once i get to the the, the colors that i'll overlay to make it purple the purple will be a little bit deeper hue and it also has a blend to it that i can use to um bring it up and introduce another color which is why in this section right here you can see like so many different colors clashing but it also comes together because when you spend that much time overlaying different colors of paint and you might darken and lighten some areas it kind of brings a cohesive image um the thing about painting is that you're always going to see brush strokes unless you have like some amazing technique <laughs> that you develop for the most or you spend a lot of time even hand going back and forth you're always going to see a brush stroke so something that um my professor taught me when i was learning art was um you have to think keep that in mind as you're painting right the brush strokes of the painting tell as much about the story as the physical um like placements of the the the, the subjects in the painting so you have to while you're painting think of that as you're making it because there are times where say i'm going like in the painting that i have in the back of me i'm going for a light airy texture but if i lay down too heavy of a paint or too dark of paint in the earlier stages it may come off as muddy or very blunt or like rough which is against the the texture that i'm going for so that's something to keep in mind i'm going to switch to a few other paintings to show you a difference in my style and then i will 
go in. Um, this is the painting that I'm working on right now. And I was practice some of the techniques that I use on it so you guys can see firsthand. Just give me a second now and do another slideshow. Okay, so this is one of my early paintings. I made this in 2019. Um, the subject of this painting is just about the power of water, right? Um, power, I mean, water is a very, like, we all need it to live, right? But it's also very disastrous, like natural disasters. Um, it carries diseases sometimes, but it also shapes the way that we live. Like a lot of the societies that we are able to participate in is because water was either very close to or very far or even carved away in these valleys that we tend to, um, to occupy. Um, so in a painting like this, it takes a lot of forethought. I don't really paint, I don't plot my, I don't plot my painting before I do it, right? So it's all kind of freehand, but even in the freehand, you have to think about, um, the layers of the painting and where you expect to go right so in a painting like this sim symmetry is very important so i use i do i'll use a ruler um to kind of make a grid on on the canvas and plot my points accordingly i will use significant landmarks in the painting to kind of guide me so this so this tip is right here i know that okay this, this is the center because i made it to be the center and i'll measure the tip um to the sides so i know that this is the exact middle point of this centerpiece that i'd like to do um this will take this took me about three four months of work to do um and this is about i would say like 40 50 layers of paint um very thinly drawn and the way to get these different brush strokes depends on the different types of brushes that you've used all right, so when I'm covering a large area, I'm gonna stop my share real quick. When I'm covering a large area of the, the canvas, I'm gonna use a brush like this because it's good to, it's, it's very big. You cover with a little bit of effort and it's not as easy to see the brush strokes because they kind of blend in together because it's so large. Well, this is something that I'm only really going to use if I'm just covering because to get the fine details with a brush like this is very hard. That it's just too big. Some parts of the brush are going to move unexpectedly. If you think of it like a rope, right? It's hard to if you're jumping rope, it's hard to exactly know where the rope is going to take you unless you're really adept at manipulating it, right? Some people fling the rope uh, handle and catch it back, but that takes time to to build. So this is simply like a first layer lightly coating, if you're gonna gesso a painting, gesso is something that um, blocks the water from seeping into the canvas. Um, so this is something that you would use for gessoing or a background. Um, now, if you're thinking about a lot of the, the brush strokes in the back were made with a brush like this, right? It's more maneuverable, it has rounded edges. So that means that I can kind of spin it and create a continuous motion with the brush and have a little bit more control. Um, this is a large portion of what I use for this painting in the back behind me. Um, these are things that I use to create like fine edges, or if I'm doing a lot of line work, this is something that I can use um, to do that on the, on the piece. I also use this to mix my paint. In my particular style, because of the, like, the cosmic, watery nature of it, I like to blend my colors directly on the canvas. Um, but it's not really advisable because once you do it, you have to commit. You only have, especially with acrylic, you have a short amount of time. And once it dries in a certain way, it's very hard to manipulate it in another way. So I would advise mixing your colors on a separate sheet, like a easel, like a, I don't even know what this is called, but this is what I use to mix the colors and apply it to the canvas after. Um, now, when you're thinking about blending, 
you want to get a brush that looks like this, right? So you can really get into those fine corners and blend. Brushes like this are more so for fine details, lettering, um, little highlights that you're trying to do. And this is another brush that I use for like kind of like line drawings, right? So say if I'm making like a one stroke dragon, this is a brush that I could use, dip it in a few different colors. And once you drag it along the canvas with a little bit of water, it will create a really like spiral pattern that I think actually a lot of East Asian art uses that technique, except with a little bit of a longer brush. Okay, so you, let me show you guys a little bit more of what I have. Does anybody have any questions so far? All right, cool. Joshua. Oh yeah, that. I have a quick okay. question. Go ahead. How do you? How do you clean your brushes and how do you make sure they stay clean and like you can use them for years and years? Um, so you cannot leave them in water after you're done. Like as soon as you finish painting, you need to go to your station, wash out the brushes with hot water. There's also like acrylic cleaners called, which is like a, a, a chemical that like breaks down the polymer in acrylic to loosen it. Um, I use a lot of, I use my hands in my artwork a lot, like physically touching the paint. So I tend to stay away from the chemicals, but I just use hot water, wash out the brushes. Once you got all the paint out, um, wash it again with cold water to keep the bristles um, formed in the right way. And then you leave them out to dry, standing up with the, with the brush facing um, upwards. Um, if you leave them in, if you leave them in um, water, this metal portion will separate from the the wood and you wasted like $20 because these brushes are very expensive. So that's how I keep mine clean. Awesome, thank you. No problem, any more questions? All right, cool. Okay, so this painting is one of my first paintings that I ever made. It's um called it's oh it's called Yidrasil. Um I based this painting off of the world tree myth, myth from Norse mythology. And basically the world tree is the tree that holds all the realms of all the realms together. There's nine realms in total. And basically at the end of each branch of the tree you hold like a whole entire world. So there's Asgard, there's Nidgard. Um, Muspelheim, a whole bunch of different um, worlds, basically. And what I brought about this painting was just kind of thinking about like what does interconnectivity with another person feel feel like and look like, right? When you are meeting somebody for the first time and you're starting to like them, right? There is a whole bunch of possibilities that can come from that. Maybe we will end up hating each other in six months, or maybe we're going to be together for a few years. But to me this image symbolizes like the bearing of fruit, the possibility of what that could look like. And um, what went into the back, the, the, like the composition of this painting is a lot about color theory and what resonates with humans and what they associate color, certain colors with, right? So reds, um, purples are very like passionate colors. When people describe like being angry, they say, I see red. When they talk about like, you catch your spouse cheating on you, I, you might be seeing red, <laughs> right? So I use that to really um, visually get, grasp the, the viewer. Um, a lot of times new artists are afraid to like use bold colors because they're, use, they're, wa they're wanting to be as welcoming to everybody as possible. But art, good art is not about that. It's about when somebody feels something from your art, that's when it's good, right? It can be good. It could be a good reaction or a bad reaction, but first you want to draw in the viewer and you have to think of it in the mind of the viewer when you're composing a piece. Like what is going to bring me here um, to you? What is, where is my eye going to be drawn um, in these pieces, right? So I use a little bit of geometry to make um, the planets look 3D just by placing them in the right way, right? So I have these three um, orbs of various colors in a triangle setting with a little center point. And if you like connect the line between each planet to the center, 
it, it looks like the corner of a room, right? And down, when you're looking at that at the front, it kind of zooms you into the center of the picture and you kind of bring your eye outward in a spiral throughout the whole image, right? I use um, directional line also to kind of draw the eye to certain places of the, the painting as well. So this place right here where you see all these lines leading around the planet kind of also looks like the planet is being sucked in as well but with a pushing out um, illusion. I, it sounds crazy, but I don't know how to exactly explain it one second. Um, but yeah, it directs your eye in certain places. So when you're, if, if there's something about the, the art piece that you want to direct people to, maybe um, thinking about how you can make it 3D is a good way. Perspective, um, learning perspective drawing, one line perspective, two, two dot perspective, three line perspective is a great way to add dim dimensions and depth to your art. Um, I would also look at the color wheel, right? There are certain colors that go well together and complement each other. And red and blue is one that is like everybody knows, right? So there is a, when you're thinking about the color, you have to think about also the relationship and how it connects to the meaning of the art, right? So in a, in a painting that is about like interconnectivity and passion between two people, um, that is a very fiery thing in candy, but there is also the, the the calmer moments, like you're laying in bed with somebody on a Sunday morning. And that's 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 a chill moment, and you want to also envision that and have a color that relates to that as well. So that is why I chose the, the color of life, something that is calming, that will also calm your eye in a piece that is very chaotic like this. Does anybody have any questions about that before we move to the next one? Um, this is a piece um, that I made for my university's dean's office. Um, it is called Severance, and it it is basically is about like cutting all ties with something and starting a new journey. Um, I literally woke up in the middle of the night from this dream where I was falling down like to earth, like as if I was skydiving, but I had no parachute. And when I woke up, I was like, usually you think of something like that and you're like you'd be terrified <laughs> but to me it was kind of a freeing feeling like knowing that um, this is not something i've ever seen before but i gotta enjoy the ride down right so this was what i wanted to invoke and with, when you notice about this piece about this piece is that this piece this piece is that certain areas are flatter than others and some areas upturned towards your eye and I use that as a way to um, indicate that there are certain pieces of the painting that are closer to me, I'm falling towards it, and there's ones that are further apart. Um, I chose these colors because I wanted it to seem like the promise of experience in an environment that was arid, right? So when you're walking through a desert, um, you're going this if you look up like if you look up from a desert this is what it looks like right but very rarely do you have um water in the desert that's what it, like oasis are and that's what the type of thing that i wanted to invoke like even though i'm falling um this could be a saving grace this could be my oasis um i usually rely on geology and like plant life and showing those type of motifs because when you bring nature and art together, it kind of reminds people of like their most like primal nature, like being around um, like trees and the outdoors, those things that connect us all, right? So depending on what you're trying to say about the artwork should, should dictate um, the shape that you may use, um, some of the elements you might bring to the painting, and again, the color. Um, this visually looks nice, but if you were physically in the space, it probably would be less so because the gaps between each area are vast. Um, those are things to think about when you're uh, composing a piece. When it, when you're first doing it, it seems very like fragmented and I'm not gonna put all these things together. But as you like trust where the paint will take you, it kind of unfolds. What I mean by trust where the painting will take you is that sometimes there's going to be like mistakes. I make mistakes all the time in my art. There's a few mistakes I'm looking at right now. Um, but that is the nature of art. Like 
is not going to be as perfect. And certain certain mediums move differently, right? So if I'm using a oil, um, I have to be a little bit more intentional because it dries slower. I have to be slower in my approach. If I'm using an acrylic, I have to be quicker and have a little bit more of a basis already pre-planned in my head if I'm doing it freehand or written down ahead of time, if I'm gonna go that route. Because um, sometimes in, in a piece, you can make one stroke and it changes the entire meaning and entire look of the piece. Um, and that is something that you've got to be cognizant of because it happens all the time. Even the, the most masterful artists, they have that happen to them. You either have to cover it up or you start over. A big way that I stop myself from having to start over is again by layering. Um, I usually cover something up with black paint and then layer by layer, I will add the colors that were originally there till I get the original color and then I can add my details on top. Um, one thing that my art professor told me when I first started off is don't be afraid to get away from the brush. Um, because people often think that you have to be like super fancy dancy with the brush, but sometimes you can find other tools that can give you a look that you're looking for. So this is a painting that I only made with one brush. I made this one brush, a credit card, some newspaper, and that was it. So I used the newspaper, crumpled it up, dipped it in black paint to see to, to make those black little marks that you see all over the painting. I used the credit card to make those diagonal lines on the right-hand side of the painting. And I also used the, the credit card to make um, the pathways for the lake and the rivers in it. All right, so don't be a slave to like what material, like what instrument that you're using. You can use, some people use spoons to paint, some people use um, newspaper, plastic bags. I use plastic bags in my art as well. So also when you're thinking about painting, painting is not just about the paint. Like you can use other materials. Um, yeah. Anybody have any questions about this one? Yeah, I had a question. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, first off, I really love this piece. It's really beautiful, really, uh, really evocative. Um, I was curious about um, like one thing that really uh, is very striking to me is the like intricacy of the edges like the you have diff there's different fields of color that have these very complex very natural looking edges which is really very realistic um, but I'm just like especially in that lower part you know in the bottom left corner I'm just um, just like the texture and intricacy of those edges looks very watery it looks it almost looks like you had you had did it something I would expect from like a watercolor painting and so I'm curious how did you get that that sort of I just like I'm having struggling to understand how you got that like delicate intricate texture using um, acrylics and a brush because I think of uh, acrylics as being kind of thick and um, and uh, did you did you dilute the the paint at all? Did you uh, water it down in some way, or how did you? Uh, what technique did you use to get that kind of intricacy? Um, okay, cool. All right. So first of all, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, this I usually don't want to tell people this because it's my little secret. Because we cool though, I'm gonna share it with you. So because <laughs> acrylic paint dries so fast, I usually work in a really cold room. Like I have my EC turned up all the way because that will lessen the, the drying process. But also you have to dilute it with a good amount of water. But if you use too much water, it's going to be too thin and it's going to make it look like a little bit gloss, like whitish, like ashy in a way. Um, so you have to add the, add the right amount of water and you are... The way, so the way that I do it is I'll, I'll squeeze the paint onto... Um, I forgot what this is called, but I'll squeeze it onto this, dip my brush into the water and use that to brush the paint out, right? So I'm mixing the color with water and I'll keep adding it to the point where it's the consistency, where um, it's a little bit thicker than regular water, right? So you have enough pigment in it where it's, it's, it's solid all the way through. You can't see through the solution that you made, but it's um, light enough that you can push it around the, the canvas. So on this, and also 
some certain techniques that you're trying to do may force you to change what you put your um canvas on so i painted this like on the floor because if i painted it on the wall the gra gravity will drag all the the the, wa the water mixture that i pulled down and it would change the image so i painted it flat on the ground um with a lot of paint on the first on the canvas and with my solution at the side i would blend it as the paint dried so you have to i would say spend if you plan on trying to go for this look with acrylics spend a lot of time getting familiar with how it feels to put on certain consistencies of paint and over time you will be able to recognize okay this is the consistency that i need to elicit this particular technique right, great thank that you was, <laughs> thank you that was a great question i don't really get asked that often but that's a great question um anybody else Um, this is another piece that I made for the uh, for the university. It's very similar to this one. This is actually a triptych. So um, this one goes with the this one. This is called limerence or yggdrasil. Um, this one is called severance, and this one is called medium because it's the middle point between these two paintings. Um, this is a painting that I made with a credit card crushed glass. The middle portion that is. Um, blue is all crushed glass that I painted over um, with paint. Um, so that's another way that I found a way to use different materials. If I did it simply with paint, it would have just looked like this, right? But this has more of a, I don't even know how to describe it. It kind of looks like a geode in a way, a little crystal, a crystalline and pops out at you a little bit more. Um, a good way to create that glowingness is to start with the darker colors at the edges and use your and use your white strategically right because you would think that the white has to be single through the middle of the piece to make it glow but when you're looking at things that glow in real life it kind of has like a swirly motion around it and i would you mimic that same motion that you see in nature or whatever reference you're using in the actual um piece itself so when you see, when I show you the brushwork that I'm going to use on this painting, I, I literally follow um, the patterns of the texture that I'm trying to find, right? So in this painting behind me, I'm trying to mimic smoke and air and like gases coalescing. So when you look at gases in the air, like in the sun, it's very like sporadic, right? And it's very loopy. That is a type of also texture. That, that's the type of hand motion that you have to mimic as well. If you press too hard, it will be too dark. If you do it too light, it will be too like light to see. So you have to be even and um, like even in your way that you apply the work. Um, anything on the last time? Um, one thing that I do in my art is use directional lines in order to drag your eye in certain areas. That's something that you may be also to use. I use these black lines to get you from the edge of the painting right here to the center. Now you're looking at the glowing portion. And as you move up in the piece, it sprawls out into kind of like an explosion, right? Now that opens your eyes up to the both corners of the piece as well. You guys see what I mean by that? Yeah. Cool. Um, this painting is something of like kind of it was a test for me, right? So I wanted to show what synesthesia looks like, but as a feeling, right? So when I am sitting in a room of music, what it feels like to me is like the music is hitting every inch of my skin and evoking a certain type of movement. If you looked at your skin microscopically, there are peaks and ridges, and it's not as smooth as you may think it is. And what I imagine this painting to be is the music hitting my skin directly and filling in those gaps. And this is what you might see. But because my art is nature based for a large portion, I, I try to mimic as much as possible natural um, patterns that you might see in the world, right? So. If you look right here, these are a pattern that flowers use in their formation. 
right? If you if you are in like the canyon, these are the kind of striations you may see on the type of rock that, you, that might be there. Um, um, when you think of like when your leg is asleep, right? That that's literally what you're looking at. That kind of static you feeling of, of what that is. Um, yeah, I think um, this is what I, what, how I painted this was I took my smallest brush and what I, uh, what I uh, explained to Adriana about um, mixing the right solution, I mixed a little bit of black paint with some water and I used it as kind of like an ink drawing um, to overlay on this type of work. Um, yeah. This is, I also used a paper towel to get this kind of, bleached background look um a good way that you could also do this is by spraying your canvas with water after the acrylic paint has dried let it soak for a little bit and once you put like a dry piece of anything over it it will lift that pigment off and leave a pattern but if you do it too much it will completely strip it so be measured into how much water that you're applying to the canvas does everybody understand what i mean by that All right, so that's the end of the slideshow. I can show you guys some actual techniques that I use in my art now. Just give me a second to set up. You guys have any questions before I move on to that part? All right, cool. I'm gonna have my phone with me so you can guys can see up close. Um, so give me one second. Oh yeah, second maybe you second. could. If 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 it's cool, like, um, do you want to show us the technique you were explaining to Adriana, like on your piece? If if it's like relevant to this piece. Oh yeah, I can try. I can try for sure. All right, let me set this up for you one second. I just dropped in um, your Instagram so people can look at some of your other um, pieces too, because there's so much more where this came from. Perfect. Thank you. I appreciate you. All right. All right cool. So, to take you through the process of me mixing this paint. Um, you can always, if you have a Blick, I don't know if there's Blicks in California, I would imagine there are. They have like studio quality art and they have beginner. I would just start with there. Like, it could be like five to nine dollars a tube, depending on the size. Um, so, so. I'll take that amount of paint, dip my brush in the water, kind of scoop a little bit up, and I'm going to spread it along the base of this, right? The water is going to keep it from drying out quickly and also give me time to mix whatever colors I want in it. The base colors for this, this painting is like blue green and yellow. So I gotta be quick. I've never done this on camera before, so if it looks a little bit haphazardly done, forgive me. You're doing great. <laughs> All 
It's hard to see because this light. At first, I started off with solid green. I mean, started with blue, but now it's a little bit a mixture. I will darken it a little bit by dipping the corner of my brush in it and adding the black paint to darken it. My teacher always told me that you should not add regular black to most art pieces because it can be too dark. You could use a mixture of colors that can give you a black, right? So um, I would say blues and reds, like you use the complementary colors to make the darker piece. So blue and red, that makes the purple. I add a little bit of orange, I'll get a little bit of brown and so on and so forth until I get a darker. Um, yeah, a darker tint. See. All right, so when you're painting, also you got to think about how the light that you're, the light in your place is going to, to affect how the paint looks. You're going to always catch a glare with red paint. So you have to keep in mind that what you're seeing in the room may not be the final, may not be the final uh, color because the gloss of the wetness is going to make it look a little bit lighter. Yeah, I go. I mean, what? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let me find a place. Okay. Cool. Do y'all see how glossy it? Maybe it's not close. So this is the, the consistency of the paint that I'm talking about. It's a little bit thick. So you have an even color when you put it down and an even color on the painting. When you are trying to darken an area, I try to start at the edges first because darkening the area is, 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 is not just about adding dark paint. You also have to add white to highlight the darkness, right? So I go over it slowly. And what I mean by push the paint around is that you use all the paint in the brush before you dip it into anything else, right? So my, the surface of my painting is a little, it's still pretty dark, right? So I'm gonna push the extra paint around in the area that I'm trying to darken. And as it dries, it will blend better. Don't be afraid to use your fingers to get it dried quicker so it doesn't mess up anything else that you're trying to do now right now i don't know if you can see but the paint is still pretty wet so it's going to look darker wet paint always looks darker so you're not going to be as deep and rich in color as it is when you first put it on um this is where brush strokes matter the most because if I'm just like that, that's gonna show up in the final product, right? So I have to be measured with where I'm putting it so that it looks cohesive and it follows the theme that I've already started for the painting. So this is supposed to be airy, fluidy. If I do too heavy with the strokes, it's not going to come out in the way that I want it to. Um, this is not always, this is not the, old, this is not the right way to do it. I would say this is the way that I have found that works best for my style. When you do start trying to visually represent your art, I think trying to, you learn the rules first and you figure out which ones to break that will suit you the best. You got what I mean? Yeah. Like think of it like dressing, like I'm not, I'm supposed to not wear uh brown shoes with a with a black suit but if i look really fly i'm finna do that because that's what i want to do so i think <laughs> that's the best way to approach art um figuring out what the rules were how other people did it how the masters did it before you and then finding a way to innovate it that it works for your style 
so that you're not reproducing the same things that other people did before. One of the things that about my art that I appreciate the most is that you're not really going to find this look anywhere else, specifically because I crafted my technique in a way that not many people are just going to come about naturally, if you get what I mean. Okay, so I gotta wait for this to dry. It's a little hot in here. So give me a second, let me turn on this fan. Oh, I also gotta change the lights in here so y'all can see it fully, one second. Nasilo, um, while it's drying, can you tell us more about like your synesthesia and like how you <laughs> like how you bring that into your art and like I don't know how other people could strive to maybe without synesthesia. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, so synesthesia is when your brain mixes two or more senses. Um, they don't have to be like physical representations, like in your actual vision or whatever mix that you have. I, the mix that I have is on um, sound and sight with a little bit of touch. So music kind of just feels a little bit stronger to me than it would other people. And it has like a form to it. Um, the way that I use it is by sourcing those colors to, to look like what I'm thinking. And so this was a, this is the painting that came for me after I was listening to the song called All Over You by Leisure. And it has a very, it's like a very deep and rich song. So while this is supposed to symbolize um, like air and gas, you would think I would choose like yellows and whites and whatever. But the deepness of that song affects the way that I will put it on the canvas, right? So if I it's, just, it's kind of hard to explain, <laughs> but it's like um, you don't think about breathing, you just breathe. So when I listen to the song, like I'm it's constantly in the back of my mind as I'm listening to it. Um, and I kind of, um, when I'm first making the piece, I just let like it translate through me. So I'm listening to music and I'm painting what I see. And after I sit that down and I'm reflecting and I'm letting it dry and things like that, I think about um, what does it invoke, right? Like, what are these um, scenes that I'm seeing invoke? So when I think about like the airiness of this, of these pieces, of this piece in particular, it's kind of just about like how things in your life coalesce in general. Like they can be unexpected, like the painting idea came to me and they can start to um, swirl and coalesce into something that you never thought it would be. Um, so, yeah, is that described to you, my synesthesia? Yeah. And the, it's a little yeah. bit hard to explain. Okay. No, I mean, it's it's really interesting, like what you're saying, how, you know, usually you'd represent the airiness, because I know your inspiration from this, from when we were hanging out, like that it's like the sun going through, like, um, at like kind of the golden hour and the, like, like making the air fear, feel full and stuff. So I feel like without synesthesia, I would be like, okay, like that reminds me of yellows and stuff like that. So it is interesting to see like that it's not just what it symbolizes, but it's like what you actually experience. Yeah, I, I feel like it's kind of like a visual diary, right? So when I'm just trying to, I'm just like a lens to what these messages come through. And the best way for me to make it as natural and unadulterated as possible is to use the colors that come to me and not necessarily that fit the theme and it also comes back to the, the idea of like subverting expectations i think it's very easy to just paint i'm about to curse i'm it's about easy to paint some shit and like put it out there and be like yo um this is art but when you are to me as an artist like you're representing things that may follow people their whole lives and it takes and you have to take that with um like a mission because you never know who you might be impacting by making these things. So I want to not cheat the process and make something that's really um, original and comes from 
like your your mindset. Um, that doesn't mean that you guys have to make something that looks like this for it to be meaningful. Meaningful art just means that you took intention in making it. Don't do the easy thing and try to take the audience someplace where they never expected to be and never have been before. Because I'm sure there's people who have made art that looks like this. But the, when you um, when you're fusing the art itself, the story behind it, the materials, and the process that you took to make it, that is what makes the entire art piece. It's more than just what you see. It's also how you came to make it as the artist. Um, that's one of the things that a lot of people don't recognize about art. The highest selling pieces, on one hand, are like, you know, there's a whole lot of art politics that goes about in choosing who's the best art, but a lot of it is also the story, right? If I died right now on this Zoom call, this painting is like three times as worth now. And it's all because it's about the story. So that's something to keep in mind too. What story are you trying to tell? Um, and how can these tools affect the outcome of it? Yeah. Um, I feel like they're a little on time. And I'm getting too into this painting. Yep, it's 854. So let me answer any questions you might have before I gotta let you go. Let your brother know. And it's all right if you don't got oh, what's up? What's up, Jen? Hi, um, I love your art. Um, I had a question for you uh, specifically related to your synesthesia, if I said that right. Um, a bit dyslexic, so words get all confusing for me. Um, is there a nature sound? Like you've talked about like seeing like um, the geodes, the topography and how that's inspired you, but I was wondering if there's a nature sound that has inspired you for your art. Um, yes. Um... There's like, if you've been, so I recently went to Yosemite, right? And there is a, um, so in like an open space where there's a lot of birds, that is like a very like powerful sound to me. Cause I think like when you're around tall trees and stuff, there's a particular type of echo that these birds have. And that to me is like, what like really intense green, yellow green looks like, like kind of like, like earthiness. That to me is what that sounds like. Um, I was all over the place, but yeah, that is one of the, the 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 sounds that I think I love the most, like birds chirping in a tree. <laughs> um, it just sounds like what life is supposed to sound like to me. That's really cool. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, I had a question. I know that you mentioned on your like power of water painting, how you like made a grid on your canvas, but I was just wondering like in general, how much do you like plan? Like, do you sketch out concepts or do you just sort of, is it project by project? Well, me personally, I've never, I have never sketched out a painting ever. Um, that is not something I think is advisable because I've, also messed up plenty of paintings that I had to fix later on. But to me, that's just the most natural way to, to show people exactly where my mind was at the time that I painted it. Um, I would advise planning it out first. It's just so much more easier, like dramatically so. Um, the grid is a, is a powerful tool for everybody that most people use. You measure, up, you measure out the squares evenly to scale the type of work that you're doing. And it's just easier for your hands to reference whatever point. But me personally, I don't, um, just like literally as a rule, I don't um, plot my paintings before. Because to me, like I'm cheating you of like my real thoughts at the time. So the way that I end up making the really fine tuned things, I, I go over it like dozens of times. I erase in a way. Sometimes I'll take a, um, a dry shirt, wet it a little bit and scrub the surface of the painting and now remove a few layers and then you have to go back over it again. But that takes a lot of time and I do not suggest it. But it might work for you if that's the type of style that you're looking for. Okay, thank you so much. This was great. Thank you, I appreciate you.
I just have a question. Like, I really enjoyed, like, the, if you can hear me, like, I'm coming to I really enjoyed the level of detail uh, and the stories that you told each one of the paintings. Like, having some of these work on, in public spaces and you know, talking about how some of this art could potentially be carried forward with someone like, for the rest of their life or a month or however long. Have, how do you deal with or how to deal with people not? they misinterpreting your art but like taking away a message that you didn't intend to i guess like how do you feel about like the messages they might be like getting to the art that you didn't either intend to or didn't put into it at all um that's it that's actually an interesting question right because when i first started painting everybody told me that what your interpretation of the art as the artist doesn't really matter it's all about what people themselves take from it and particularly for my style of art that bothered me because it's like I'm making a visual diary. Like these are yeah. real moments in my life and it means a particular thing to me. And for some reason, a lot of the people who like my art the most are like astrologers. And with my like super science-based focus of my art, it really kills my spirit sometimes to hear their interpretations of what I'm creating. But that again goes with the territory, right? You never, you don't get to choose how, what, what moves a person or what they, like whatever they come to, to bring about like them relating to your painting. All you can appreciate is that um, they felt something at all. And that's something that I've come to, to get better at because at the end of the day, like this is about me, but it's not really about me. I'm sharing a, a lesson and experience. And for some people, the, the lesson may be somewhere else. And that's something that, um a good artist comes to respect because art i think like art is kind of dying in a way because the instagramification of most things so when you have something that somebody comes to see in person they're like oh my god wow this makes me think of this and this and this um that itself could give you new meaning to your art that you didn't think um you had before so i would say kind of embrace it um and you know that you're doing it right when a lot of people come to you with different ideas and things and just those um, perspectives can end up changing how you feel about your own art as well. Because there's certain pieces that I thought meant something and somebody said, hey, this makes you think of this. And I was like, damn, you might, you might be a psychologist somehow because this is, it really, it's, it comes out and it shows. So I'll say try to embrace it and don't let it bother you too much because you can't really control how people perceive things for the most part. No, well, anyway, like this was like great experience to sort of like hear almost like the, not only like what the painting is, but yes, there was a naming and the story behind it. Like, like this is like some of my more impactful art full experience I've had on um, this person speaking. So thank you so much. Damn, bro. She about to make me tear up on this on this Zoom call, man. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. That means a lot to me. Like honestly, like I love um people who generally take an uh, interest in like to me, I'm like bringing you to a new world. So just to have like passengers along the way, that's amazing. I really appreciate the time that you guys allotted me. And if you have any time, some to way down the line to connect or whatever, I would definitely want to like do one of these with you guys again. So just let me know, Jessica, if you would like to. Yes, definitely. Um, and I and I put your Instagram so that everyone can keep following your art and keep in touch uh, through that way. But um, yeah, thank you so much. Like this was seriously so awesome. Um, I've learned a lot. Uh, kind 